Okay, here's lesson nine in the EMT course in the trauma unit. We're going to talk about injuries to the head, face, neck, and spine. This is a fairly quick unit in terms of your online study. Spend a lot of time on this in lab. And so this will be a rather quick presentation to go with this quick online prep. Uh, content, we're going to go over the anatomy of the head, face, neck, and spine that matters to you at the EMT level. How to assess and manage the soft tissue injuries to the head, face, and neck and then how to deal with the musculoskeletal injuries to the head, face, neck, and spine. And then we're going to talk about assessment and management of closed and open head and traumatic brain injuries, TBIs. That's a little bit more complex topic. We'll start it here, and then we'll pick it up um, in the medical sections when we talk about strokes and bleeds and things, but it's um, kind of fundamental stuff for that discussion. As far as anatomy, uh, the next three slides have information on there for you to sort out what bones you need to know. There's numerous bones and this can get overly complex. At the EMT level, there's just a few things that we need to know. We'll talk about the regions of the cranium and I've marked those with a red arrow on the next slide. Then we'll talk about the regions and numbers of vertebrae in the spine, so cervical, thoracic, lumbar, etc. Then we'll talk about uh, the three or four bones on the face that we really need you to know and um, go through that real quick. So. Several areas of the um, spine, regions of the, of the, I'm sorry, of the cranium, regions of the cranium, the occiput, the occipital area, which is kind of the back base, and then the temporal, there's one of those on each side. That's what the two means by temporal. There's a temporal bone on the left side and a temporal bone on the right side. Same with parietal. There's one of those on each side, kind of separated by a suture line there. And then the frontal bone. So. Um, sphenoid and ethmoid, that's nice to know stuff, um, but not need to know at the EMT level. We need you to know frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, and be able to um, describe that if a patient has a laceration in his left temporal um, skull area or um, has um, hematoma and uh, soft tissue damage to his occiput or something like that. So know those four um, really well. Um, key for you to be able to communicate with other medical professionals. In terms of division to the spine, there's 33 total vertebrae. They're divided into cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. And the number of vertebrae there are 7, 12, 5, 5, and 4. Uh, realize that the sacral and coccygeal um, spine is mostly fused, particularly the coccygeal. Those are totally fused together, so it's really pretty much impossible to palpate um, those individual uh, spinal processes on as you're doing a palpation in the back. But cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, um, definitely you can palpate those and describe an injury or tenderness in a certain area. And um, just general background medical knowledge, you should know 33 bones, uh, 33 uh, bones in the spine and 7, 12, 5, 5, and 4. Skull anatomy, I realize the frontal bone um, is one of those that we talked about earlier, and then you're talking about the face. We have the nasal bone, which is fairly obvious, the maxilla, and the mandible. Now, you should already know mandible from your work in airway stuff. And then the zygomatic bone. Um, and then there's this concept of the orbit. The orbit um, is the eye socket, more or less. And there are m several bones that comprise that. I don't really care that you know each of those specifically. But when someone talks about the zygomatic arch or an orbital fracture, um, you should correlate that with area around the eye. <clears throat> Soft tissue injury, and I certainly could have found more gruesome pictures, and you can with a quick Google search. I wasn't really trying to gross anybody out with this, but a couple of key points here. First of all, even small wounds, small lacerations to the face and scalp bleed pretty dramatically but the blood loss is not a big deal overall. It's not a large volume overall in most cases. Pretty standard call, especially for night shift medics, um, is a, a bar fight downtown and somebody was hit with a bottle. And there'll be two or three guys pretty much covered in blood. And we finally find the one that's actually cut. And you dig around through his, through his hair and you find this very small laceration that's created all this drama. Um, and in many cases, it's already stopped bleeding. So that's kind of the top picture there, just reminding you that um, it could be quite impressive and dramatic when you see all this bleeding, but it's not a lot of blood. 
and they're easily stopped with some direct pressure. Get that uh, scalp, those scalp veins to contract uh, with direct pressure. Of course, you know, tourniquets aren't an option. Uh, so it's really just holding direct pressure. Uh, and in many cases, you can get into an elaborate, uh, you know, kind of Red Cross Advanced First Aider sort of bandaging to that. But in, in most cases in the field setting, a uh, little direct pressure um, and, and those scalp wounds will, will stop for you. Uh, the second one down, injuries to the face, and I could have found a dozen horrific uh, gunshot to the face pictures to put on there, but I didn't want to. Um, in this case, probably this is blunt impact, maybe a steering wheel or uh, maybe an assault. But the thing is that the bleeding's not a big deal, and it's kind of hard to control. Some of these are, are pretty jagged lacerations, stellate lacerations, and there's bleeding and swelling. But that's externally. We want you to also think about underlying airway structures. And particularly if you place your patient in a supine position, when they have this facial trauma, the drainage of the blood is going to go back into their airway. And so some common sense, some judgment, some critical thinking is necessary to avoid causing an airway problem where one doesn't exist just because of some need that we feel to place our patient in a supine position. Spinal motion restriction is important, we'll talk about that, but a confirmed airway problem trumps a, a potential spine problem every time. The bottom picture is actually an autopsy photo, um, and so obviously there can be dramatic wounds um, to the neck, and any soft tissue wound in the neck, you've got to worry about whether it hit a carotid or a jugular vein, and you've got to worry about whether there's airway involvement, and that's just common sense, but to round out a full presentation on it, we, we wanted to mention that. So that was the soft tissue. Now what about the bony injuries? So if you have um, bony injuries to the cranium, to the spine, we're going to try to limit motion as much as possible. Immobilization isn't really what we do. We do spinal motion restriction. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. And then again, consider that underlying damage and bleeding and consider neurogenic shock. Now neurogenic shock isn't important enough topic and it's somewhat confusing so it gets its own lesson and that's lesson 10 coming up but uh, for now limit motion consider underlying damage and then consider that neurogenic shock may be involved spinal motion restriction um, not spinal mobilization although those two terms are used intercham interchangeably um, but we're just trying to restrict motion and for many many years we did a big we did made a big deal of this and any little movement was not cool and we were supposed to limit um, motion completely with the use of cervical collar, CAD boards, head immobilization, long spine boards and the National Registry skills still include seated spinal motion restriction and supine spinal motion restriction and those are important stations and you're very likely to encounter one of those on your National Registry skills exam and so we do lots and lots and lots of practice on that for that purpose. But the local agencies here, as in with many local agencies around the state and around the country, have moved away from the use of backboards uh, to a large extent or maybe even completely. And so we need to prepare you for the test as well as prepare you for uh, real life. And unfortunately, there's a contradiction there right now. And uh, until national testing standards catch up with local practice that's kind of where we are in your resource document I included a statement from the American College of Emergency Physicians about the use of backboards and I need you to read that and, and understand that but uh, realize that while your first 10 calls you run as an EMT you may not use backboards to a large extent in order to get to be able to run calls as an EMT you have to get to the National Registry and the registry is very much into backboards. Moving on to head injuries. You can have an open head injury where there's been penetrating trauma or been such a blunt impact that the skull is, is open. And you can also have closed. Either way, you've got underlying brain tissue trauma. And when brain tissue is traumatized like any other tissue, it swells. The problem is that the cranium is closed. And unless there's been an opening made by the trauma, there's no way for that pressure to be relieved. Whereas if you 
um, smack your arm or your leg, it can swell and the skin will stretch and the pressure can be alleviated to some extent because of stretching of skin. There's no stretching of your skull. And so this swelling leads to increased pressure inside your skull, increased intracranial pressure, ICP. Brain tissue doesn't like to be squeezed. Brain tissue works best when it's not under elevated pressure. And so this is a, a thing for us to deal with. Now in the closed head injury, a similar problem is to the open head injury, but now there's no, there's definitely no way for the pressure to be relieved. I'm not saying that open head injuries can't develop elevated intracranial pressure. They certainly can, but there's also at least a chance that the opening of the skull will provide some pressure relief. On a closed head, head injury where the cranium's intact, there's no chance that pressure can be relieved. And so the bleeding inside the cranium and the swelling of that traumatic of that traumatized brain tissue will raise ICP and sometimes up to the point where the patient suffers um, significant problems or death. So elevated ICP is a bad deal. In order for the brain to be perfused, in order for circulation to occur in the brain, in order for blood to get into brain tissue, the patient's systemic blood pressure has got to go up because now there's more resistance to flow coming into the skull. The intracranial pressure, as it is elevated, provides more resistance, more friction loss, and the, the blood pressure needs to rise in order, in order to overcome that. And so you end up with a patient with a pressure that may be surprisingly elevated, like 220 over 110 or something crazy. And you tend to focus on that as a bad thing because it is not normal. But what it is is a compensation mechanism. And so um, we don't mess with that blood pressure. We let that blood pressure go and, and let it get higher because that's the only way for blood to get pushed into the brain. So what happens? Well, as the intracranial pressure rises and you have elevated ICP, the brain will attempt to squeeze out the only hole that's supposed to be in the skull called the foramen magnum, which is at the base of the skull, base of the cranium, right where the spinal cord comes out. And right where the spinal cord comes out, right above that are the structures of the brain stem. The brain stem is very important. And that is the first area that's going to be compressed as the brain tries to alleviate this pressure and squeeze out that hole or herniate. So brainstem herniation is a problem because it's pushing, the, the brain is pushing, the pressure is pushing on the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, cerebellum, but mostly pons and medulla. And the pons is involved in motor control and sensory stuff. Medulla is involved in breathing and heart rate. So breathing patterns, or whether the patient's breathing at all, the control of all that goes on in the medulla. And so they also have some sensory issues and midbrain issues with vision, hearing, eye movement, body movement. And we test for those um, in a field neuro exam. But we wanted to talk about the fact that the elevated blood pressure is necessary to push blood into the brain. And as your blood pressure goes up, then your heart rate doesn't have to be as high. Your heart rate will decrease kind of as a reflex to the hypertension. And that's because the pressure in the rest of your system doesn't need to be high. Your system senses that, slows your heart rate because the pressure is quite high in the heart and the lungs and the toes, but it needs to be high in order to perfuse the brain. So that's one sign of, of extreme elevated intracranial pressure is an elevated blood pressure with a decreased heart rate. And then the pressure on the pons and the pressure on the medulla particularly will cause a change in your respiratory rate or your respiratory pattern. And it's not important to us at the EMT level to be able to name all these various strange respiratory patterns. There's Biot's and there's Cheney-Stokes and uh, central neurogenic hyperventilation and stuff like that. But if you notice that the patient has a, a strange breathing pattern, perhaps they're breathing abnormally deeply, or perhaps they're breathing um, deep and deep and deep in a crescendo sort of pattern, and then, and then it slows down and maybe even stops for a little bit. And so there's a strange breathing pattern. Um, that is 
a definite indication of pressure on the medulla, which is probably from uh, attempted brainstem herniation. So traumatic brain injury care, maintain everything as normal as possible. Let the blood pressure go high, but we cannot, not, not ever let it go low. No hypoxia, no hypotension. Any one instance of either hypotension or hypoxia, even for a little bit, dramatically increases the risk for morbidity mortality for these folks with, with TBIs. So if you, uh, you know, the initial injury happened, we couldn't do anything about that. It's this secondary injury that we've got to be careful with. So we do want to support blood pressure and, and prevent hypotension in traumatic brain injury. We do want to prevent hypoxia. We want to keep glucose normal, temperature normal, everything as normal as we can and um, you know, move this patient toward urgent definitive care, which isn't going to be done in the field, <clears throat> but we want to avoid hypotension at all costs. And a long time ago, that wasn't what was taught, but in the last, I don't know, 20 years, that has been very clear is that you must prevent hypotension. So what do you do when your patient does show signs of herniation? Their blood pressure is sky high, their heart rate's dropping, they have strange breathing patterns, they may or may not have pupil changes, and uh, you're pretty sure that this patient is, um, is experiencing herniation. There are some protocols um, in some places that will allow you or direct you to do what's called controlled hyperventilation, which would mean you would, uh, would ventilate your adult at twice the normal not 10 times a minute, but you would intentionally ventilate your patient at 20 times a minute. And in m many cases, those protocols don't worry about a, a breathing rate as much as they do a capnography level. And we haven't talked much about capnography and, and really won't at the EMT level, but I just wanted you to know that there are protocols out there that do direct controlled hyperventilation. And usually that is using a capnography target more than it is a ventilatory rate target. Um, but for you to realize that there is some temporary benefit in some cases when a patient is clearly herniating, not just your regular TBI patient, but somebody who's clearly herniating, you really don't have many options. And so even though there's some bad side effects that come from overventilation, in the case where your patient is clearly herniating and is headed for cardiac arrest, some protocols will uh, direct you to do controlled hyperventilation. So that's really all I wanted you to know about it was just have a general idea that that does occur in some cases. And um, some protocols will allow it, some don't. There's all kinds of issues. Obviously, you have an impact on blood pressure when you ventilate faster. You have um, an increased risk of gastric distension, not to mention the uh, difficulty in doing that with a breathing patient. So there, there aren't any good options with patients who are herniating, and this is the least bad of, of the several options. So anyway, uh, overall summary here for head and neck, face and spine trauma, uh, control that external bleeding, splint, um, a spinal motion restriction, use a collar, use a backboard. Look for that internal bleeding as well, internal bleeding in the cranium, internal bleeding that... Uh, causes you airway problems. So internal bleeding inside the skull, first of all, the amount of blood that they bleed inside their skull is inconsequential. It does not cause them to be low on volume. What it does cause them to do is be elevated on intracranial pressure, which gives you the risk of herniation, which gives you the risk of death. And again, in some, some cases, you'll do something extreme, like intentionally hyperventilate the patient. And you should know that triad um, the three things that go together, elevated blood pressure, decreased heart rate, and uh, respiratory rate is either slow or irregular. So hypertension, bradycardia, and funky breathing patterns. That is technically called Beck's triad. I don't, uh, I'm sorry, that's called Cushing's triad. I can't believe I said that. That's called Cushing's triad. But I don't even care that you know the name of the triad. I really care that you know those three things. The three things that show you that uh, extreme elevated intracranial pressure, hypertension, bradycardia, and strange breathing patterns. So that's where we're headed with, uh, with this lesson.
and uh, we'll see you in lab for lots of practice.